We come to our scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, I'm going to add the last little sentence at the end of chapter 12 as part of our reading this morning. And so technically we'll start at the last verse of 1 Corinthians 12, but then read all of chapter 13. It reads like this. And now I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all that I have away and I am delivered my body up to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it too will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial or the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I, I gave up childish ways. For now we see as in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is God's word for us today. At this time, I would like to invite uh, any of the kids ages 5 through 9 who would like to go to Children's Chapel, you can be dismissed at this point. There are uh, folks, leaders in the back center door there that would love to receive you and welcome you. Um, I know many of you are disappointed that young Calvin Carter was not uh, able to get up and read the scripture. He wasn't, he's a little under the weather this morning. He was scheduled to be our scripture reader today, but um, he wasn't able to be here, so you got stuck with me. <clears throat> I'm not nearly as cute. I also just want to take a moment before we, we dig into the scriptures um, to thank some folks. Uh, we, as many of you know, now that we've gotten through the Advent season, we are embarking on, on a little season here in January and February where there will be work going on, uh, particularly up here in the front on the platform, um, to extend the platform and, and do some modifications to it. And that work actually began this week. You may not notice a whole lot. But over in this part of the room, we had some concrete demolition uh, that was done. And um, some of you who were in the church building during the week, you got a sense firsthand of, of uh, sort of the mess that was made with that. And we had an army of people here over about two and a half, three days who have been cleaning and vacuuming and vacuuming and vacuuming. Um, an awful lot of work was done. Uh, Brian Richards uh, has done a lot of that work. Uh, Melissa Druin and her husband Robert have been a part of that effort. Uh, we had deacons came in uh, during the week. We had a uh, battalion came in on Thursday, and basically instead of doing what they normally do on Thursday evening with battalion, they basically just turned it into a big giant service project, and so they came in and vacuumed uh, Julian and, and Ginny Valberg spent uh, all day here on Friday vacuuming. Uh, Michael Carmen was here. There's others. Andy Bird was here. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing people. Bob Butler, I know, was, was here for a significant period of time. Thank you all for, for the work, and I'm sorry if I'm not, not mentioning you by name, but we're really grateful for the work that you did to, uh, to help make our sanctuary as... It, it might be as clean as it's ever been right now. Um, <laughs> But just to give you a heads up, um, so when you come next Sunday, um, if everything goes as planned, you will begin to see um, a handicap ramp 
uh, installed over in this part. In fact, the Binney family is over there, and we're glad you're here, but next week you can't sit there <coughs> because there, there will be a, a handicap accessible ramp that will begin to be built there. And so, um, so you'll start to see some things each week. Some things will be a little different. We're going to kind of um, we're going to adopt that, that uh, Marine Corps slogan, Semper Gumby. We're going to be flexible all the time. Um, and we'll adapt and be agile with, with the things that are happening. So, but um, anyway, thank you all to your, for your, your work here in our midst. <clears throat> you may not recall this, but I, I recall this. Uh, 364 days ago, we began a series of messages studying 1 Corinthians. Um, last year, in, in 2022, uh, the second Sunday of January was tomorrow. In other words, on, on the date, the 9th. And it was on January 9th, uh, this past year, that we began studying, walking through this, this letter that the Apostle Paul has written to the church in Corinth. That it's really a, a letter that God himself uh, through the Holy Spirit, inspired Paul to write, and it was not only for them, but, but it's also for us. And so we've been studying this book, and you may be thinking, wow, we've been doing this for a year. How slow can you be? <clears throat> but I, I've heard stories of pastors preaching in t you know, a whole book of the Bible, and it takes three or four years to get through it. Uh, those are probably longer books than 1 Corinthians. But nevertheless, we've been walking through. It, it's not, not been without any breaks. We've taken breaks for Christmas and Easter. We took a break last summer uh, for the whole summer, and we, we spent the summer walking through a number of different psalms. And so it's not like we've done it 52 weeks like this, but we are, we are still in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're rejoining that study now. Uh, and it will take us right up to Palm Sunday. We will finish, if, if everything goes as planned, we will finish our study of 1 Corinthians the Sunday before Palm Sunday, and then we'll, we'll uh, obviously turn our focus to the celebration of Easter for a couple of weeks. So, but that's where we are, and we're picking up today in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But in, in chapter 12, if you, uh, just to kind of jog your memory from three or four weeks ago, in chapter 12 of this letter, Paul is, is saying, was introducing to the Corinthians the subject of spiritual gifts. And the subject of spiritual gifts was relevant for them for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was relevant for them because many of the Christians in Corinth seemed to be preoccupied with spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts had become the most important thing in their lives, and particularly in their spiritual lives. They were measuring their, their spiritual maturity based on the spiritual gifts that they had. They were, they were more focused, arguably, on spiritual gifts than they were on the gift of Jesus as their Savior. But this preoccupation with spiritual gifts also reflected that they had a misunderstanding of what spiritual gifts were and what spiritual gifts were for, what their purpose was, what they were intended to accomplish. In essence, many of the, the Christians in Corinth had made spiritual gifts the goal and the focus of their Christian faith. And so, after introducing the, the subject of spiritual gifts in chapter 12, Paul then concludes chapter 12 by transitioning, and this is why I read that last statement from chapter 12 in our scripture reading today, he begins by transitioning to the thing that really should be their focus and that really should be our focus in the Christian life when he says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. And if you've ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and, and my guess is that many of you have, perhaps most of you have, 1 Corinthians 13 is, is one of the most familiar passages in all of the Bible, primarily because it's a beautiful passage, it's very poetic, it's about love. It's read in, in many weddings because it's about love. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is not just about love, and it's not just about 
the way that we love one another. It, it's, it's fuller than that. It's richer than that, and we'll get into that as we go here. But you do know, you do recognize that this passage is about this more excellent way, and that more excellent way is the way of love. And so it begins like this, the first three verses. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I sacrifice myself, if I give everything that I have away, or if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. If you don't catch it here, Paul is basically saying that without love, none of your spiritual gifts have meaning. They're empty. Without love, all of these things are meaningless. And so one of the questions that we might want to, to, to think about now is, well, what is love? I mean, doesn't love mean different things to different people? I mean, a lot of things that mean different things to different people. I mean, this is 2023. We all have our own definitions of things like love. Well, instead of giving a definition of love, what Paul does instead is he offers in a way that everyone should be able to understand and perhaps that we can all even agree. He says, instead of giving you a definition, let me just describe what love looks like. And so he describes it, and I think this is pretty familiar to us, and I think these are ways that we can recognize love to be present and, and active in, in life as we see it. So he, he begins now in verse 4 by listing the different ways that love shows up, what it looks like. So first he says love is patient. It's long-suffering. That's literally the word he uses here. It's long-suffering. In other words, love isn't just an emotional response that we would have to a particular person or a particular set of people in a given circumstance. Instead, he's saying that love really is a choice to act. Love is an action. It's the choice to willingly suffer, if needed, for a long time. Long suffering. It's patient. He says love is kind. It's the choice to treat people the way that we want to be treated. This word kind here in the Greek language literally is the word grace. When he says that love is kind, what he's saying is that love doesn't treat people the way we think they deserve to be treated. Remember, grace is unmerited favor. It's, it's, we think of God's grace to us and we realize that God has given us something good that we didn't deserve. That's what kindness is. When Paul says that love is kind, he's not saying, ah, just treat people the way you feel like. Treat people the way you think they deserve to be treated based on the way they're acting right now. No, no, no. Love is gracious. Love is kind. Treat people the way you want them to treat you. The way that God has treated you. He goes on, love does not envy. It doesn't, love does not look at what God has provided for other people and say, hey, wait, 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 I should have gotten that. That's what I deserved. Love doesn't covet what God has provided for someone else. Instead, it rejoices with people because of what God has done for them. You see, love has the ability to look beyond yourself, to just be happy for somebody else. Something good happens to someone else, and we can rejoice with them. It doesn't envy. Love doesn't boast. That's another way of saying that love is humble. Love understands grace and mercy. And therefore, love doesn't say, hey, look how great I am. Instead, if anything, love says, isn't God amazing that he would do anything kind for me? Because if God gave me what I really deserve, then he wouldn't, he wouldn't give me good things because I'm a sinner. But love is humble. So love is grateful. 
but it doesn't boast. It doesn't say, well, I'm, all these things are happening in my life that are good because of, well, obviously, I'm just a very virtuous person. No. A, a proper understanding of grace humbles us so that we're just grateful. Similarly, love is not proud. It's not arrogant. It's not puffed up. It's not about self-promotion. Love isn't rude. Love doesn't bring shame or embarrassment on people. Isn't that pretty intuitive? That, that love isn't, isn't rude. Love doesn't make other people look bad. It doesn't, doesn't bring ridicule or shame or embarrassment on others. He says it isn't self-seeking. In other words, love doesn't manipulate people or circumstances for personal gain. That's not what love does. Then he goes on and he says, love is not easily angered. This is patience and humility applied to our temper. It doesn't mean that we should never get angry. Jesus got angry sometimes when, when God's character or God's word was somehow being twisted or questioned or dishonored, then yeah, he, he got angry. But this is referring to the decision to respond calmly when you and I personally have been hurt or we become irritated. Yet you almost have to include, it's not just when we're hurt. Sometimes we just get annoyed and we get angry. But this is, this is a decision to be calm. Not, not to say, because if you think about it, when, if I take on arrogance, if arrogance and pride is, is the main posture that I'm operating out, out of, and then somebody hurts me or somebody dishonors me, what's my response? How dare you? Do you even know who I am? Right? Isn't that what we, we may not say those words, but that's how we act. How dare you offend me? Do you know who you're dealing with? You know, and then we get this little head wiggle thing going. I don't know if you, if you saw this this week. I, I saw this little, I think it was like a story that was circulating through social media. A couple weeks ago, when, when all those flights were being canceled, you know, all over the globe because of this storm here in our country, there's this, this story of this, this man who comes to the counter at one of, these, one of the airlines and, and there's this woman behind the counter who's obviously you know, overwhelmed by the volume of people that are looking to rebook their flights. And he just kind of pushes himself up to the front and he gets to the counter and he says, I need to be on this flight. And, and she tries very calmly to say, well, I'm, I'm very sorry, sir. I know you're disappointed and, you know, we're all kind of working through this. But you're going to have to wait in line like everybody else. I can only deal with people one at a time. And the man says, do you know who I am? And she gets on the, the speaker and she says, your attention please, here at gate B26, we have a man who doesn't seem to know who he is. Can so, <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was so funny. <clears throat> I don't think I would have been, thought it was funny if it had me, been me that she was talking about. But that's, that's kind of what we do. And love doesn't do that. Love doesn't say, how dare you? It chooses to respond calmly even when we're offended. Love keeps no record of wrongs. In other words, it forgives. It doesn't, it sets people free. It doesn't hold people responsible for, for everything that they've done. If, if God held you and I responsible for every single thing that we have done, where would we be? We would have no hope. We would have no right to stand in his presence, let alone anyone else's. He says, love does not delight in evil or wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Notice that, that Paul seems to be saying here that the opposite of evil is not so much good, but the opposite of evil is truth. At least that's how he puts them in juxtaposition. 
The implication is that anything less than the truth is evil. It's not really loving when we, when we try to avoid offending people by compromising the truth. It's easy, it's understandable why we do it. We say, okay, well, boy, this person really can't handle the truth right now, and so I won't say the truth. I'll just soft pedal it. I will compromise. I'll say less than the truth. That's actually not loving because love rejoices with the truth. Now, let me say this, lest we rush to some conclusion. Given everything else we've said, love also is not obnoxious about the truth. It's kind. It's not rude. It's humble. But, Paul says, it also delights in the truth. It delights in speaking the truth. It also delights in walking according to the truth. In summary, this is where we come to verse 7. Verse 7 is a summary statement. Having, having said these things, given this description of what love looks like, he summarizes in verse 7 by saying, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In other words, love always protects and it always perseveres. You may, may not re recall this, but, but in my mind, there's a real connection here between what Paul is saying in chapter 13 and what he said back in chapter 8. You may remember back in chapter 8, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about people who, who eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols, and he's gone on this big discourse about the fact that, you know, these idols that are worshipped in the Roman world, they're nothing. They're not, they're not real gods. And so you could make the argument that as Christians, we can eat any meat that we want, even if it's been sacrificed to a so-called idol. That idol's not real, so we just thank God and eat what we want. And that's not wrong. But, but you'll recall that, that having laid out that big theological argument, when it comes down to a relational approach, what he says is, look, we need to love each other so much that if me eating meat should cause you to stumble, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because love always protects. Love always bears all things. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. To love someone is to desire the best for them. And it's even to believe the best about them. You know, we see somebody do something, and it's very easy for us to immediately begin to judge their heart. Oh, those, those people, well, they, they hate certain things. They love certain things. And we, we go from their actions to, to immediately interpreting their motives. Well, the Scripture says, actually, there's only one who can see the heart, and that's God, not, not you and me. Love believes the best and desires the best for people. That's what love is. That's what should be the goal of our faith. It's the goal of the Christian life, not spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts is not the measurement of maturity, how we love. Now, that is a, is a measurement of maturity. And then we come to verse 8. And verse 8 is answering a question. The question that's, that, that we perhaps could ask, having read verses 1 through 7, that I think Paul anticipates, is why is Paul calling the, the church in Corinth to make love the goal and the focus of the Christian life and not spiritual gifts? And here's his answer in verse 8. It's because love never fails. And by contrast... Spiritual gifts do. They do fail. Listen to what, what verse 8 says. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it too will pass away. You see what he's saying? He's saying pursue love because love perseveres. Love doesn't end. 
Love doesn't pass away, but all these gifts that you're, that you're pursuing, that you're measuring your maturity based on, these things are temporary. They are passing away. Now, this, beginning at verse 9, is where 1 Corinthians chapter 13 starts to get fuzzy. I don't know about you, but, but I, I read 1 Corinthians 13, and everything seems to be going great. I'm understanding. Love. Okay, I get it. Love is patient. Love is kind. All these things. These are, these are pro, you know, it's speaking in prose. It's speaking in language I can understand. But then we get to this section for the rest of, of the, the chapter where it gets really, really poetic, and it sounds really, really pretty, but what in the world is he talking about? What is he saying? I think what Paul is doing here is he takes these last four verses and he digresses in order to, to explain why it is that spiritual gifts, the spiritual gifts that he has mentioned, why are they passing away? Why are they temporary? So listen to verses 9 and 10. He says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Why are these spiritual gifts going to pass away? Paul says it's because they're imperfect. When perfection comes, then there's no longer any need for imperfection. Well, what does that mean? What's Paul talking about? I think he anticipates this question of what are you talking about, Paul? I mean, we're, we read it and, Paul, what, what, what are you saying? I think he anticipates that question. And so he answers the question by giving us two metaphors, two analogies. And the first analogy is in verse 11, the second analogy is in verse 12. Analogy number one is this, verse 11. He's saying there's an analogy between imperfection and, perfe and perfection. That which is imperfect and that which, which is perfect. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Okay, so in this analogy for perfection and imperfection, when he refers to being a child or being childish, do you think that's a metaphor or an analogy for imperfection or perfection? It's imperfection. The, the contrast is, but when I became a man, is that imperfection or perfection as it relates to being a child? It's perfection. You see, being a child is representing imperfection. Becoming an adult, this is not about being a male. This is about being an adult as opposed to being a child. When, when you become an, an adult, that's analogous for perfection. Now, does this mean that all adults are perfect? Go like this. Okay? We, we know that that's not true. So, so what are we learning then about how Paul is using the idea of imperfection and perfection? Does he mean flawless? I don't think so. I think what he is saying is that perfection is more like a reference to completeness, wholeness, and imperfection is incomplete. You know, when you, when you have a child, we don't say, boy, you're terrible. Look how flawed you are. No, no, no. We just recognize that children are not finished yet, right? They're still growing. Now, when you get to an adult, this is, this is part of the problem we have as adults is we get to being adults and we say, ta-da, oh, this is it, <laughs> Right? So it's not about perfect, it's not about being flawless, it's, it's really more about process. So when I'm a child, I'm imperfect, I'm still in, in process, but we become adults and we get to the place where we're now finished growing, at least we were hoping we were. We just start growing differently, I guess, different directions. Okay, so that's the first analogy. The second analogy is in verse 12. Verse 12. 
And obviously in this analogy, now, when Paul says now, that's analogous for the imperfect, the incomplete. But then he refers to then. And then is analogous with the perfect or the complete. So here's the interpretive question for this whole chapter. What is Paul referring to when he talks about then? He says, now we see dimly, but then we will see clearly. Then we will see face to face, right? What is the then that he is talking about? All right, so I have to ask you a question. How many of you think that when Paul refers to then, that he is referring to the return of Jesus Christ when we, will, when we who are in Christ will be taken into the presence of God and we will be given glorified bodies? How many of you think that that's what he's referring to? Okay, a lot of light hands. Okay. My guess is that more of you think that, you just, you're a little scared. You think I'm setting you up for failure, right? <laughs> I think most Christians think that. Most Christians tend to think that when he says, now we see dimly, then we will see face to face, that we're thinking, that's glory. That's when Jesus comes back. And then everything will be wonderful, and our understanding and our knowledge and all that will be complete. It will be whole. I think that means that most of us are pretty much in, in the same line with most 21st century evangelicals. I do want to challenge your thinking, though, a little bit with the possibility that there could be another interpretation of what Paul is talking about. I think more, more than likely, the reason that we tend to think that Paul is referring to the return of Jesus and, and glory and being in the presence of God is because of this reference to seeing face to face that we assume that seeing face-to-face means seeing God face-to-face, knowing even as we are known. And certainly when we see God, we will see Him face-to-face and we will know even as we are known. But if you think about where the church in Corinthian is in the flow and the progress of Revelation, is there anything in the context of this passage of Scripture that specifically talks about the return of Jesus. And I'll, I'll just let you know for the sake of time that I've gone, gone back and looked at chapter 12, and there's nothing in chapter 12 that, that I think is specifically talking about the return of Christ. When you look ahead to, to chapter 14, there's nothing in chapter 14 that seems to be referring to the return of Jesus. And I don't think there's anything in chapter 13 that is a clear reference to the return of Jesus Christ. It's, it's inference that we're making but it's not a clear, straight-out-of-the-text interpretation that this is about the return of Jesus. Think about it from a little different angle. If you look at verse 9, he says, For now we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But then when you jump ahead to verse 12, he says, Now I know in part, but then we will know fully. Okay, so he uses in both of these instances here, he talks about knowing in part as being a current situation, and there's going to be a then when we know fully. So here's the question. Aside from the fact that Paul and the Corinthians are not yet glorified, and I mean, that's a given. They're not yet glorified. Jesus has not come back yet. Jesus hadn't come back for them. Jesus hasn't come back for us. But aside from the fact that they are not yet glorified, is there any other sense in which, as Paul writes this letter, that his knowledge and their knowledge is partial and not complete? So, for example, let me me maybe ask this a little differently. Was their knowledge the same as our knowledge? Okay, I hear no's, and I agree with you. So, for example, we can open our Bibles, and when we finish reading 1 Corinthians, we can go on and read a book called 2 Corinthians. 
Did they have that? No, not as they're reading 1 Corinthians. Paul's written this letter to them, but he hasn't yet written 2 Corinthians. How about, how about the book of Acts? The book of Acts hadn't been written yet. Paul is living the book of Acts. It wasn't written about until after these events already took place. So they didn't have the book of Acts. We have that. Many Bible scholars believe that at this point in time, the Gospel of John probably hadn't even been written yet. Certainly the book of Revelation hasn't been written yet. You see my point? Even we, we have information. We have more perfect knowledge than they had as they read this letter. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with their knowledge. It's not flawed knowledge. It's just not complete. It hasn't fully unfolded yet. If you haven't figured it out, another interpretation for this passage of Scripture is that Paul is not referring to the return of Jesus when he says, then, but he's rather referring to a time when God's revelation concerning Jesus Christ and the gospel will be complete. In other words, that he's referring to the closing of the canon of Scripture. When we have the full disclosure of the Word of God. Now we see dimly. Then we will see fully. Now it's logical, it's even responsible. I'm going to try to move quickly here for the sake of time. But I think it's responsible to ask, well, how does this fit into the context of what we're reading here? Does it even make sense? I mean, it's a great thought. Great conjecture, but does it fit the context of this letter? Well, let's see. Look at verse 8. I'm not going to read it for you. It's, it, it's, on the, it's going to be on the screen. Yeah, there we go. But you look at verse 8. I guess it's possible that we could, that, that Paul could be encouraging the Corinthians to make love the goal of their Christian life instead of these spiritual gifts because these spiritual gifts will pass away in eternity. But wouldn't it seem more relevant if he were telling them that these gifts might actually be passing away in their lifetime? He says, these things are passing away. But but why would he say, well, these things are passing away, but don't worry, it won't be in your lifetime. He's saying, no, hold on to love. Hold on to these three, faith, hope, and love, because these things aren't passing away, but these spiritual gifts are. How about verses 9 through 11? If adulthood in this analogy was a reference to eternity, then that would imply that that we will all be children as long as we're living this life. But in the very next chapter, chapter 14, verse 20, Paul is going to say, stop thinking like children. Well, you've just told us that as long as we're living in this world, we're going to be children. I don't know that that makes sense. I think it seems very likely that Paul is connecting what he's going to say in in chapter 14 about stop acting like children, and he's connecting it to this analogy here in chapter 13. Don't be pursuing childish ways. Be pursuing adultish ways. Or verse 12. As you look at verse 12, I think it's easy to understand why the reference to -to face-to-face causes us to think about eternity. I think that makes sense. But in context, I don't think this is a reference to to -to face-to-face with God necessarily. It doesn't say face-to-face with God. It could simply be a contrast to seeing in a mirror because that's what he contrasts it with. He says, now we see dimly as in a mirror. Then we shall see face-to-face. Ever looked in a mirror? I'm sure you have. When you look in a mirror, you see a true image, but you can't see everything. You don't see everything clearly. For for one thing, the image is reversed. You ever notice that? You raise your right hand, but that guy raises his left hand because that's one of the properties of a mirror. But not only that, a mirror is two-dimensional. You can't see behind things in a mirror. But face to face, you can. 
Have you ever tried to look at the back of your head in a mirror? You can't do it. Now, I know you. You're saying, oh, yes, I can if I have two mirrors, right? Is that how you want to live your life? You're going to walk around with two mirrors? Here I am. I got 3D vision. You ever tried to drive backwards by just looking in the rearview mirror? And I know some of you are like Mater in cars, world's best backwards driver, and you can do it. I get it. But you really wouldn't want to drive around your whole life like that. It's much easier to just kind of turn your head, look backwards, and see face to face. Similarly, well, I'll just leave it at that. I guess you can kind of tell that I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward this interpretation of what Paul is saying. That he's saying, even as I write this letter to you, Corinthians, these gifts are passing away. The need for these gifts is passing away. The closer we get to having the complete revelation of God, the closer we get to the day when these gifts will cease Paul doesn't say, in eternity, these three things will remain, faith, hope, and love. No, he says, and now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And so his point is, hold on to faith. It is that which unites you to Jesus Christ. We're not saved by way of our works, by, by way of our gifts. He says, you're saved through faith. So hold on to faith. That's what unites you to Christ. He says, hold on to hope. Because hope is the certainty that we have that God will fulfill His promises to us. Hope is what allows us to live today in light of what we don't yet see. And He says, hold on to love. Christ's love compels us. It's the love that we've received from Jesus himself that compels us and even propels us into living this life. That we might love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we might love one another in the body of Christ, the family of God. And that we would love those who don't yet know Jesus enough to introduce them to the risen Lord. That's why I think he says it's the greatest. It's the most powerful. It compels us and propels us into living this life. I want to I close simply by, by highlighting this. I, I know I've spent a lot of time the second half of the message here kind of getting into the weeds around an interpretive posture toward what Paul is saying at the end here. And so for some of you, that's been, that in, that's been interesting. You're like, okay, yeah, this is maybe a different perspective, all those things. And that's part of what Paul is saying here. But I don't want us to lose the power and the emphasis of what Paul said in the first half. Because here's the reality. If you and I are being called to hold on to love, that faith, hope, and love are these things that remain, and love is the greatest of them, then what that means is love is really the power from which we live the Christian life. And I want you to see that what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth and what Paul is saying to us in this chapter is not only a to-do list. He's not saying, okay, you're, you're focusing on the wrong things, you're focusing on spiritual gifts, I want you to focus on love, and here's the list, ready, go, get to work. I don't think that's really what he's doing. I think what he's really doing is he's saying, I want you to understand that love is the most powerful part of the Christian life, but I also want you to understand that it's not your willpower to love that is the, the most powerful thing in the Christian life. It's really understanding that when I describe what love looks like, I'm not only describing what, what God is calling you to, I'm really describing the way that God has dealt with you. That's the way that he has loved you. That's how Jesus Christ has loved you. Think about it. When, when you and I are called to love, we're not being called to love out of an empty tank. What am I, what am I going to do to fill my tank? I mean, because most of us have sort of a cost-benefit analysis when it comes to love, don't we? We say, well, I'll love you as long as it doesn't cost me too much. <laughs> 
because i got to have enough for myself. I mean, I can't give away more than I actually have. And so we're always taking inventory of what we have to measure how generous we can be with our love. But the gospel says, God has already loved you. God has already loved you with more love than you can measure. And so you can never out-love what he has loved into you. So the reality is, our tank is already full. We're already loving out of a reservoir that will never be empty. And so the point of all of this description of what love is, is it's not only to describe what love is so that we can love this way, but it's to remind us this is how God has loved you. He has been long-suffering with you. He forsook his rightful place at the right hand of the Father to become identified with you and me. He was long-suffering. He had compassion on sinners. He became associated with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. He had nothing, but he didn't envy those who had much. He really had everything, but he set it aside and took nothing so that he could be with us. He didn't promote himself. He wasn't puffed up. He didn't shame or ridicule the downtrodden. He didn't manipulate circumstances to promote himself. He was not easily angered, even as his enemies spit on him and beat him. He didn't keep a record of wrongs. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He spoke the truth in love, and his love persevered all the way to receiving the just wrath of God for our sins, being forsaken by the Father. He hung on the cross and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because I believe what he was hearing from the Father was, depart from me, I never knew you for us. So that we could have a part in his inheritance. The greatest of these is love. But the greatest lover of all is Jesus. He has loved us. Therefore, let us love. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for being the one who has loved patiently, loved us patiently with long suffering, that you have had compassion on us. You were not self promoting, so much so that, that those who wanted you to be self promoting got frustrated with you and ultimately called for your crucifixion. You didn't shame or ridicule those who did not receive you. You actually wept for them. You are not easily angered. You keep no record of wrongs. You speak the truth in love. And you gave yourself that we who were far away from you might be brought near, brought into your family. Lord, with this love fill us that we might give generously even extravagantly to the people you place in our lives because we know and we trust and we have confidence that we can never outgive the love that you've given to us lord make this true of us help us to hold firmly to to these three faith hope and love but the greatest being love we pray in jesus name amen